So I will be recreating the fabulous pink, hot pink silk beaded dress from Breakfast at Tiffany's and it just so happens that I have a primary source for the recreation. I have the dress that the silhouette of the pink dress ended up being based on. Here she is wearing the dress to premiere of the film Ben-Hur. But it means that I have this primary source to reference throughout the making process. And so I have all that at my fingertips, which is such an exciting prospect for this project and another reason why I was keen to take it on. Okay, so before I make a start on the toile, I actually need to go and get the original Givenchy dress that I will be using from my collection as a reference for this project because it's not currently with me. So let's go grab that now. Success. We've got it. And I'll take it back and let's go see what's inside. So I have put the dress on the mannequin. I hope you can see it all right. It's got a bit of a front and a back view. Just as a disclaimer before I start, I'm not wearing gloves um, when I'm handling this piece. That is because the general advice when you are handling items that are heavily beaded, uh, such as this or embroidered, is that you don't wear gloves. Mainly because it poses more of a risk of the threads uh, catching on any of the beading and tearing it or causing any damage. So I've got clean hands taken any rings off and I'm now ready to show you. So firstly, let's just have a look at how beautiful it is. Look at that beading. It's so beautiful and actually if you look at it, it's really quite similar to the pink dress. There are only a few minor differences but everything else seems to be pretty much the same. When you look at the the width of the shoulder strap and the shape of the neckline and the same at the back. Got the sort of low scoop at the back. Please do excuse this side opening here. It's not fully closed, mainly because the waistline of the dress is lower than the waistline of the mannequin, so it's not closed properly, but it also gives us a chance to look at this opening, which is a side back zip and the zip finishes at the waist and then hangs freely from the waistline and then there is a little hand-sewn weight added at the bottom which is so that it hangs nicely so that it won't pop out of the skirt which is incidentally done with done up with poppers so that is something that i will be looking at with mine when i'm going to make the twirl as I say, the only noticeable difference I can see firsthand with the silhouette of the dress is that the skirt on this seems to be a little bit narrower than the pink dress, which looks fuller in photographs. This one feels more streamlined. But in general, I think they're really quite similar and the neckline is the same. And this is gonna be great for drafting the 12. So on that note, what I'm actually going to do is take some of this elastic and I'm going to map out some of the, uh, the, the lines and curves and shapes of the dress so that once the dress is taken off all that is still on the mannequin and I can use that when I'm draping. Um, the only difference I'm going to make is as I say the waistline of this dress is lower than this so I'm going to raise the neckline ever so slightly just to make sure that it all stays in proportion because I will be making mine to the sort of natural waistline of this mannequin. And I'm just going to start pinning.
So I don't know if you can see, I've just marked all along the neckline, along the armhole, the shoulder line width, everything that I will need just as a reference for when I am drafting the toile. I can now take this off and get onto draping. Before I get started drafting the toile of the dress, I want to first look at some of the photos that I got when I saw this dress in exhibition. Now, I've seen it twice, and as far as I'm aware, two versions of this dress exist. There is one in the Newbridge Silverware Museum, and the other is at the Hamid Museum in The Hague. Apologies if I butchered that pronunciation. I hope I haven't. So there are two versions of the dress. I have seen both. Um, when it comes to film costumes, it's really not unusual that two exist. In many instances, film costumes have duplicates, especially for pieces like this that are worn in scenes of sort of action and lots of movement and you know throwing things and pushing a cat and crying as Audrey does in this scene. So it's not at all unusual that there's two. So what I'm gonna do is pull up some of the photographs that I took of the version at the Newbridge Silverware Museum and have a look at some of the details. So the first picture I'm gonna pull up is one that I took on flash, which is quite good because it means that you can see all the details of it. And the first thing I can see is that the dress has a side zipper. So it opens at the side, which was not at all unusual for Givenchy's work. In fact, the majority of pieces that I've seen that were made by him opened at the side. Uh, it made it a lot easier for people to dress themselves. You know, it was much more functional to have a side zipper as opposed to a back zip that you might need help with. So we've got the side zip. But if we zoom in, we can see that the zip doesn't seem to extend all the way down to the skirt. It seems that the zip stops at the waistline, which is actually the same style opening as the Givenchy dress from the same collection that I'm using as a reference. I'll go on a different photo now, onto this one. Because something else you notice is that although the waist the zip stops at the waist. There seems to be a sort of overlap of the skirt. On the bodice, the opening is at the side seam, but the skirt side seam is pushed further back, which I assume is to sort of make it less visible so the line isn't broken so that it looks sort of very smooth from the front and side and then the seam is at the back. And if you zoom in, you can see that there's lots of hooks and eyes where this overlap is, which I've not seen before. On this piece that I'm studying, the zip finishes at the waist and then the skirt side seam is, is in line with that zip. But this one is pushed back which is very clever, but I'm just gonna have to think. If there's an overlap of fabric, where my thumb is is the side seam, where the zip is. So the skirt, and this is the waistline, the skirt, the bodice zips up there, the skirt then comes over and hooks along there so the skirt side seam is sort of a side back, so it goes there. So how do I attach this edge here of the fabric with this edge that's underneath to make a seam? It must be sort of like a placket. I don't know if I'm making any sense. I'm just trying to figure this out in my head. Maybe if I vocalize it, Sort of like Tetris, trying to figure out how all this goes. I think it must sort of be like a placket, really. But I need to play with that on the toile. I don't know if any of that's making sense, but I'm figuring out it in my head. <laughs> Another thing we can see is that 
there is actually another difference between this the construction of this pink one and the reference one that I'm using because this dress, the pink dress, is put together with a princess seam. Whereas the dress that I'm studying has a dart. Something else is that this dress seems to have a strange sort of insert piecing on this princess seam, which is very unusual. I'm not sure what purpose it serves. I can only assume this was perhaps an alteration later on. I don't think it's intentional. I don't think Givenchy said, oh, let's, I want this design to be unique because it's going to have this strange, small slither of fabric in the princess seam. So unless any of you know a reason why that would be, I don't think I'll be including it in mind. I'm really glad that I've had a look at these photos before I start on the toile because I know now the certain little differences that I need to make in terms of the construction. I now know how it's supposed to do up and where the seams are supposed to be. So this is really useful. Okay, so I am now gonna move on to making the toile. I've got my calico fabric and I'm not gonna film the process because I'm gonna film the whole thing making it in the actual fabric. So there's no point doing it twice. So what I'm gonna do is use the magic of editing to just... Ah! Done. If only it was that easy. <laughs> Let's have a look at some of the details of it. So let's have a closer look at this. As you can see, I've also done a toile of the bow. This has been cut on the bias, as I noticed the original was in the example held at the Newbridge Silverware Museum in Ireland. And that's not unusual for Givenchy. It's just a great way of helping the fabric to sculpt around the body because when it's cut on the bias, it has more of stretch in it. So it fits really nicely around the waist. Please ignore this little triangle of calico that came about because I accidentally got an ink splodge on it and it was upsetting me, so I had to cover it up. And if you'll notice here, we've got some of the little fan appliques which I put on there as a test to see how far out they will be spaced. You can also see I've got the princess seams at the front here. And if we turn it to the side, we've got here will this, where the side zip will be. And if you come in a bit closer, this is, I figured out how 
the skirt will work, so I've just pinned it at the minute, but it's got this extra panel of gathered fabric. So the zip will come to here, and then there is essentially a placket here that lies flat, and this gathered panel will hook over and secure there to cover the opening so it's more hidden. At the back, again, we've got the low scoop line, and we've got princess seams at the back. I haven't been able to see at the minute photographs of the back of the original to see how it was made, but I think this is probably how it was done on the Givenchy dress that I've been using as an example. It also has this princess seam at the back. I think the neckline is just too low for there to be a dart there, um, because the dart would probably just go all the way up to the neckline, which wouldn't look right. So I think this is probably how it was done. Also ignore this princess seam here. I hadn't made notches on it to mark where everything lined up, so I ended up doing that three or four times, and by that point it had just warped, so that's, we don't like that, but this one is much smoother, and now this is all sort of preparatory stages for the actual thing when I come to make it, and I've made notes of everything. I also am really pleased with the fullness of the skirt. I think it looks pretty good. Let's try and do a side by side with the original. So all in all, I'm very pleased with it. And there's only very few minor changes I'll need to make. Other than that, we'll be ready to cut it out in the real fabric. All right, that is it for part two of this video series. Thank you very much for joining me as I make the toile. Next time, it will all be about the beading, which will prove to be an interesting experience to say the least. So I hope you will join me for that one as well. In the meantime, I hope you have a lovely day wherever you may be, and I will see you in the next one.